Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday. Uh, we have a big show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. There is a lot that is breaking right now in Israel and in Gaza. The Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, is on the ground there. We also have updates um, vis-a-vis Ukraine and uh, what is going on there. Zelensky wanted to make sure he is not forgotten about as these things are unfolding. We've got developments here domestically as well uh, with uh, some movement maybe towards the Speaker of the House from the Republican Party. I don't know. It's a mess. I can't even say at this point, but we'll give you all of those details. Also, we wanted to talk a little bit about the discourse in general, the rhetoric on both sides, which has been horrific, genocidal. I've never seen so much just like casual talk of genocide in my entire life, and I genuinely do mean from both sides. So we're going to show you a little bit of that. We also have a new presidential contender on the Democratic side, um, Cenk Uger, founder of the Young Turks, who kind of sort of teased it. I would say we got the exclusive. It. I would say we got the exclusive. Yeah, we accidentally yeah. got the exclusive. Yeah. He brought it up on our show. We were like, at first I didn't know he meant it, and then yeah. he said it again. And I was like, wait a second, you're serious about this? Well, he made it official last night, so we'll play you a little bit of that. And also, um, we have some updates on RFK Jr., uh, the right now, definitely taking the knives out. He went on for what he, I assume, thought would be another friendly interview with Sean Hannity. It went very differently. He's also launching a, a new ad that I have to say is really quite good. It's a it's a great ad. We're, we're going to break every, uh, all of that down. We have two administrative things that we want to know. We hadn't been bringing it up, obviously, because of everything going on, but our crew is flying down to Atlanta tomorrow for that focus group. So just everybody stay tuned. We will have that democratic focus group that is happening there. We'll be asking about Israel and Palestine, but there's a lot of other stuff, obviously, to get to as well. And then second, um, on an administrative note, we will not have a weekend show as normal as a podcast um, that usually posts along with those clips so that we can be available for breaking news that will happen over the weekend, just so everybody can keep that in mind. Thank you to all everybody who has been supporting us, though, uh, by the way, this week. It, it does mean a lot. We, we've been working very, very hard. None of us have been sleeping all that much and making sure that we're getting things very accurate and all of that um, for all of you. And we take your responsibility incredibly seriously. So I just want to say thank you um, to everybody for that. We will have that focus group, some more exclusive content um, for everybody next week. But we will preview that um, as the clips roll in. And just thank you for enabling this. It's going to be higher production than last time. Yeah. And um, shout out to Griffin and Mac and the whole crew mm-hmm. who have been working overtime this week to to, you know, do our best to make sure that we are providing you the most up-to-date and most accurate information that we possibly can in what is a very difficult and um, challenging situation to report on. All right, so let's get to the very latest with regard to uh, Israel and with regard to Gaza. Our own Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, is on the ground in Tel Aviv in Israel this morning. He just gave a press conference with um, Bibi Netanyahu. Let's take a listen to a little bit of what Tony Blinken had to say. If you'll permit me, um, personal aside, I come before you not only as the United States Secretary of State, but also as a Jew. My grandfather, Maurice Blinken, fled pogroms in Russia. My stepfather, Samuel Pizar, survived concentration camps, Auschwitz, Dachau, Majdanek. So, Prime Minister, I understand on a personal level, the harrowing echoes that Hamas's massacres carry for Israeli Jews, indeed, for Jews everywhere. And I think that's emblematic of the personal connection that many Americans mm-hmm. feel to um, to Israel and have, you know, deep connections there, family there, relatives there, friends there, et cetera. Um, you also had in that same pre- press conference Netanyahu emphasizing that he views Hamas in the same way that he views ISIS, mm-hmm. that he believes that they should be treated in the same way, that they shouldn't be dealt with, negotiated with. Any country that does deal with them should be sanctioned, that they should be, um, you know, completely sidelined and uh, kicked out of the nation of community communities, which, you know, understandable sentiment there. We also have an updated number in terms of the number of Americans who were killed in those attacks. We can put this up on the screen. We actually have even more updated numbers. As of this morning, yesterday, the number was 22. Today, the number is 25. They say at least 17 other Americans are unaccounted for. We know that some unknown number also held um, hostage. So uh, that's where we are in terms of an American death count. Yesterday, Blinken made some interesting comments as well as he was preparing for his trip to Israel. And obviously, the Israelis were watching and listening very closely to what top American officials have to say. Um, You know, very important that they uh, continue to receive the endless support that we've always provided to Israel. Biden giving very clear comments. Um, You know, we will stand with Israel. We always stand with Israel, et cetera, et cetera, exactly what you would expect uh, any American president to say. And one of the things 
that uh, Blinken brought up was a little bit of a reminder as Israel now launches this all-out assault and siege on Gaza, and we're going to give you an update on that in a moment, that um, you know Israel should be holding themselves to the same standards of international law as all nations should be. So a little bit of a reminder there. Let's take a listen to that. And of course, what uh, separates Israel, the United States, and other democracies when it comes to incredibly difficult situations like this is our respect for international law uh, and, as appropriate, uh, the laws of war. Uh, we do everything we can to make sure that in these situations we avoid civilian casualties. That is in direct contrast uh, with uh, Hamas, which uses uh, people as human shields. Uh, it um, actually seeks uh, to be, uh, put Palestinian civilians in situations uh, where they could be harmed. Sagar Hamas obviously murders. There's uh, no uh, no need to defend them or, or justify any of the atrocities they committed. For the U.S. to talk about following international law and making sure we don't target civilians, you know, people who have been murdered in our drone strikes might have something to say about that. And then with regard to Israel, even putting aside the apartheid state, even putting aside the blockade, even putting aside the occupation, the illegal settlements, et cetera, we already know they have announced a complete siege, which they have undertaken. Um, you now have all of Gaza without any electricity. This is 2.2 million people. We're not talking about, these are not all people in Hamas. In fact, half of them are children. This is already collective punishment in violation of international law. You already have hospitals, schools, medics who have been actively targeted by the Israeli military. So for him to say, of course, Israel is going to follow international law. Well, they're already in violation. I think it's a, a point of pressure um, on them. And I'm going to save some of my uh, geopolitical commentary on how the U.S. and all of that um, for a little bit whenever we're going to talk about Gaza specifically, because I do think that there's some stuff that needs to be highlighted. In terms of the response, um, what they are in a situation right now, and I saw it put very eloquently, actually, uh, by Marshall, is that previously the Israeli state and the international community looked at Hamas as a political organization with a terrorist element mm -hmm. kind of within it. So Hamas would periodically carry out acts of terrorism, but this is, if, at the end of the day, we're not going to say legitimately elected, but it was elected, let's all be honest, by people inside of Gaza. Mm -hmm. And so it had some sort of political administration. This is something that uh, Christopher Hitchens used to talk about all the time as well. Now, though, after the attack, and specifically on a bulk of the casualties being civilians, the shift in the Israeli and the Western international community is towards the way that we used to look at ISIS, which is this is an eliminationist uh, tactic now, as opposed to one that can be managed. You previously alluded on one of our past shows about quote unquote mowing the grass. So yeah. to them, they're like, we have to eliminate Hamas entirely as both a military and a political entity. Now that is obviously an incredibly, incredibly difficult task. I'm gonna save some of the actual military commentary for what that will look like. But that's part of why they are in the difficulty that they are because ISIS did the exact same thing in our counter ISIS campaign when they would occupy the city of Mosul, uh, many of the cities that they took in Syria, they would intentionally you know, stack women and children on top of them and you know the international community and airstrikes for both by the US and also by a lot of the Syrian you know uh, fighters that we had there on the ground like we all have to be honest a ton of civilians were murdered you know in that uh, in that anti-ISIS campaign and that just underscores I think mm. the immense difficulty of all of this situation now you can't I'm not going to tell you which one is which that's for all of us really to decide well, but I just think that that's that highlights the you know the real the real pretzel that all of us are in, in terms of quote unquote, how you deal with all of this. Well, and um, Hamas has no scruples, whatever, they're happy to use mm -hmm. civilians, including you know fellow Palestinians yeah, and as hospitals. pawns. And no it's doubt, horrible. no doubt yeah. about it. But also Gaza is one of the most densely populated mm -hmm. places on earth. And these people are locked in a cage, like they, they cannot leave. They are not allowed to leave. All efforts to establish any sort of humanitarian corridor have so far failed. Um, you know, negotiations with Egypt, I, I've seen mixed reports whether they're ongoing or whether Egypt has just said, no, we're Egypt not gonna establish said no. an emergency corridor. Yeah. Um, and so when you have this densely packed population, um, you know, even if Hamas wasn't trying to use civilians as human shields, you have, Babies, families, children everywhere in, you know, huge high-rise apartment buildings. And as I said, in hospitals, I mean, they've been striking marketplaces. They've been striking mosques everywhere. There have been more than 2,000 strikes, and we'll get to some of the, the imagery from that. But one parallel I did want to draw out with uh, ISIS 
is, you know, in a sense, he's correct because both of these organizations have either, I mean, ISIS is directly comes out of blowback yes, from uh, right. American, you know, war in the Middle East and deep stabilization in the Middle East and war in Iraq in particular. And Hamas has also been bolstered and built up by the West and specifically by Netanyahu. I mean, we had that quote for you the other day yeah. of how he actively told his own party, uh, the Likud party, that, hey, if you want to thwart a Palestinian state, which he does, then what you got to do is build up Hamas. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to some of the domestic Israeli backlash and rage at Netanyahu and his administration. Um, that is a key part of it that, you know, people have have seen that tactic. They've seen how Netanyahu and, and his ilk and his ideological brethren have thought Hamas was like a useful foil for them to prop up. Um, so there's also a blowback element here that that does actually track with the the creation of ISIS and how that all came to be. Um, we wanted to update you as well on there had been this report that uh, Egyptian intelligence officials were saying, hey, this attack didn't come out of nowhere. We warned you. We directly warned Prime Minister Netanyahu 10 days before this that something big was going to happen. And now uh, we have an American congressman, uh, Congressman Call, put this up on the screen, seemingly confirming, saying, we know that Egypt had warned the Israelis three days prior that an event like this could happen. Three days before. We know that this has been planned as long as a year ago. And then, you know, when he's pressed further, he says, I don't want to get too much into the classified, but a warning was given. So Americans now confirming that Egypt had warned them. And recall, part of the uh, the context here is that Netanyahu, with this very extreme government that was very in favor of the illegal Jewish settlements, they had moved a lot of IDF forces from near Gaza to the West Bank to protect Jewish settlers. And that's part of why the response was so slow. That's also part of why this intelligence perhaps was dismissed out of hand because they were more focused on what was going on in the West Bank with the settlers than they were what was going on in Gaza. And the other thing I would say, even putting Sagar aside, these reports of the Egyptian intelligence and the you know very clear warnings that they are saying that they gave to the Netanyahu government, um, Hamas was conducting war games. They were like, and Israel knew about this. They thought it was just a feint, but yeah. they were out there conducting fake raids on villages and practicing many of the tactics that we saw deployed in their um, atrocities and in this massacre. So, you know, there's a lot of rage on the Israeli side at these clear failings that, yeah. you know, that we're learning more and As more about. As we said, we have a couple of clips we're going to show you guys, which are crazy from, this is not rally around the flag time inside of Israel. It's very, they may be rallying around the nation, but they are not rallying around, not uh, around Netanyahu, Netanyahu in the same way that Americans did for George W. Bush. To extra context on that, Congressman McCall was one of the chairmen of the intelligence com uh, committees and actually received a classified intelligence briefing, but explicitly confirming outright that Israel was warned by the Egyptians. This was also backed up. Uh, Channel 13, Hebrew, and Israel also reporting that uh, Bibi Netanyahu's office had to secretly then walk back his comments and was like, yeah, actually they did warn us. But of course, they report that in Hebrew, um, that they didn't actually put anything out in English. That's another thing I want to highlight. Just remember, anything that comes out of English from Hamas um, and from Israel, it's intentional and it's directly targeted so that people like us can report on it, but they don't always tell the full story. And I've noticed this pretty significantly in terms of the efforts by putting stuff out in Arabic and in Hebrew, which is totally different um, than what we are getting. Part of the reason why it's extra difficult and we have to parse translations, make sure the translations are correct. There's also an interesting other backup to this Intel story. Let's put this up there on the screen. I'm curious, we could read this in a couple of ways. CNN uh, is reporting, quote, initial US intelligence suggests Iran was surprised by the Hamas attack on Israel. So we could read that as truth. Uh, we could read that uh, possibly as, uh, you know, we could read that as the actual thing that happened. The other way to read it, this is the uncharitable way, but I think we should have to represent this as well, sure. is America doesn't want to get into a war with Iran. Uh, and I, so um, I appreciate that. <laughs> by the way, that's the truth. I appreciate I that like and that. I, I also support it. <laughs> However, let's say if the facts said actually Iran helped plan you know, this attack, I'm not quite sure that America would report that currently with the domestic political situation uh, that's happening. So I am 
skeptical um, that that is actually the case. I would much rather listen to the Israelis um, and to the Egyptians and the other people in the region who actually have buy-in into this situation. Now, from right now, the Israelis themselves have not said that there is any indication that Iran was involved in the attack. In fact, so they said they haven't seen indication. They have the not indication. seen any yeah. uh, of that indication. So I am going to go off of them because they have a direct interest in this. I'm not saying I believe them, but I'm saying from if they had any indication, given Netanyahu's past, I mean, he came to our country to lobby against the Iran deal. Uh, this is a regime and a people who, if they believed Iran was directly involved, I do not doubt that they would say it. Now, we could also read it the other way, which is they are terrified of also fighting a two-front war. So even if they have direct evidence that the Ayatollah himself you know, ordered this attack, maybe they wouldn't report it because they're like, listen, we got enough on our hands. We got to deal with this whole Hamas situation. I don't need a two-front war with what is going on. But I, you know, even, I don't actually, let's just put the truth aside. Like, I think that's probably to a good end you know, in order to avoid a big geopolitical conflict. I'm just trying to contextualize what that quote unquote intelligence could say. I do believe the Egyptian report though. I do believe that 100%. The Egyptian report that they been reported warned now Netanyahu. By the Israelis, has been confirmed by the Israelis, yeah. confirmed on the record by the Egyptians, and now confirmed by the US uh, intelligence. Because that, that's just a matter of were you warned or not? And that's an explicit, explicit failure. It, it shows you too that so much of, like you can gather the intelligence, so much of it is up to the human beings to exactly. interpret what right. is relevant and what is not. And, um, you know, the the picture that appears to be painted here is that Netanyahu and his government had their own bias and interest in the West Bank over southern Israel and near Gaza. And so they dismissed it as like, oh, no, they're they're actually just interested in more work permits. And I think it's cool. We've we've got this handled. And so they didn't see what was right in front of their face. And as I said before, because they had redirected the IDF to the West Bank, I mean, the stories about how long people had to wait to get any, I mean, people hiding for 20 hours, Sometimes left, on their, hours. left yeah. on their own, fending for themselves in terror. And this is part of what is so shaken Israelis to their core because they had so much faith in their, and understand, I mean, how much money goes to their surveillance state and their intelligence apparatus and to the IDF. I mean, it's massive. All of the billions of dollars spent on the, the high-tech fence that was easily disabled by Hamas using $100 drones. So that not only failure of intelligence, but the failure in response is part of what has so shaken the Israeli public. Um, at the same time, back to the point about, you know, fears of a broader conflict and specifically fears of a potential war with Iran, which some U.S. politicians on both sides of the aisle have already been calling for. You had a warning issued from the president of the United States yesterday, uh, I would say directly to Iran, but they, he says, you know, any actors, let's take a listen to what he had to say. Made it clear to the Iranians, be careful. So be careful, he says directly there to the Iranians. Put actually Colvin up um, the 10th element here, A10, because it actually fits directly into this. Sagar and I were watching very closely yesterday afternoon and we were getting ready to do a breaking news segment because there were false alarms all over Israel about potential second front of this war opened up by Hezbollah, which of course has Iranian backing. And the reason this was so significant is because you have tensions so high and you already have war drums beating from so many quarters. They were saying there's drone strikes. There were reports of new paragliders coming mm -hmm. in from Hezbollah. There were sirens sounding all across Israel. And I mean, this just underscores how high tensions were. They say in that article, of, as, as an example of how tense things are along Israel's northern border with Lebanon, a suspected airspace intrusion into Israel from Lebanon had Israeli authorities telling residents of northern communities to seek shelter until further notice due to human error, an app designed to alert residents malfunctioned adding to the confusion. This was a terrifying you know, hour or so when we were very closely watching what was going on because it could ex be exactly the spark that leads to a much broader war. Yeah, remember we've got uh, a carrier strike group that's always moving, already moving to the Eastern Med. We've got another carrier reportedly on its way. That's a hell of a lot of firepower. We've got the we've entire got Americans naval held group. Hostage still. We've got Americans held hostage. We have uh, thousands of American uh, service members who are in Bahrain, not that far away. 
from all of this. So things could jump off very, very quickly. Yeah, and that's what you said. Also, that's a great reminder. You know what? You know what I'm glad we did? We sat and we said, let's see if it's real. Let's see if actually what happens. And unfortunately, you know, immediately the all the reports were getting massively retweeted and shared. And I saw Israel is under attack. Two front wars confirmed. And then an hour later, they're like, oh, it's a false alarm. Another reminder, you know, part of the misinformation block that we did uh, on our th- Tuesday show, be careful. Yeah. Wait for confirmation, triple confirmation, quadruple confirmation until you see it with your own eyes. Even then, make sure it's not deep fake. Make sure that it's not uh, deceptively edited. That is the difficulty of the situation we're dealing yeah, with right now. Yeah, and this was coming from Israeli yeah, and officials. this was coming straight. That's, but still— <laughs> This was an official news that's source. That's why we wait. But yes, we waited to have visuals and confirmation, and I'm glad we did because it was, you know, it would have been terrible if we rushed to air with like, oh my God, this is happening, and it could lead to this broader war when it was not accurate. So everybody just keep your heads about you as best as you can. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.